Welcome to Wanik Science. This video is on the scientific process, or how science really answers questions. In general, we think of the scientific process in five major steps, although I'll say up front that scientists rarely follow these in their order as we see them here. This process is very fluid, but it works as a very good guideline. So we're going to begin first with our observation and question. And in this case, what we're thinking of is that people simply observe things. You notice things. Things are changing. You're gathering facts. And in most people, it should elicit questions. Why does this happen? It's important that you recognize, though, that the questions here must be testable. If a question is not testable, it's out of the realm of science. And many questions are off limits in science for that very reason. The second part is a hypothesis or prediction. And in this case, what we're thinking of is this is a potential answer that we are going to test to see if it does in fact answer our original question. And we write this as an if-then-because statement. You often hear of this as a conditional statement. If whatever idea we have um, is in fact related to the question, then we should be able to predict some kind of outcome because there's a relationship between those two ideas. The next part is the controlled experiment. Well, we're actually going to test to see if, in fact, those, relation, those two things are related, actually have some validity. And so this is what most people think of in terms of science. It's our experiment. It's our test. And so in our experiment, we're going to set up at least two groups. Each of these groups the experimental group versus the control group should be exactly the same in every way possible, with the only exception being an experimental variable. Another name for the experimental variable you often hear is called a manipulated variable. And then we're going to collect our results. And our results are often in the form of data. And so we're going to make some measurements, whatever we're looking for, and we're going to record those in an organized table and we'll probably even graph them to show the relationship between these variables. And then finally, we're going to make some kind of conclusion. We're going to state whether or not our hypothesis, the potential answer to our question we started up at the beginning, is our hypothesis acceptable or do we need to reject that hypothesis? Ultimately, this is a summary statement and scientists will often go further and make some application to this statement as well. So let's try it. Here we have a pretty typical autumn scene and there are lots of things you might observe in this picture and many questions as well. But one of the most common questions that come up when students see this picture is, why are the leaves falling off the trees? We see this all the time. Well, you've made an observation and a question. The leaves are falling in the autumn. Why? Are the leaves perhaps affected by the temperature? Certainly it's getting cooler. So, our hypothesis. If the trees are exposed to colder temperatures, then more leaves will fall because... Maybe we think the colder temperatures are freezing capillaries that are holding the leaves together and they degrade. Okay, that's a great question and a great potential answer. So let's test it. How would we begin to do that? So we're going to develop a controlled experiment. We're going to take two potted trees or maybe groups of trees. And the idea here is that they're going to be as identical to each other as possible. And we're going to put them in two different greenhouses, an area where we can control temperature. Some of them are going to be in 5 degrees Celsius room, which is just above freezing. And then some of them are going to be in 22 degrees Celsius, about room temperature. And then we're going to count the leaves over the course of three weeks. Now, clearly the diagram here doesn't really show trees, but it is, you get the idea that we've got two identical systems, except the experimental group is at one temperature, a cold 5 degrees Celsius, and the other group, our control group, is at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, two terms you're going to hear a lot, which are really important in scientific experimental design. The first one is independent variable. It's the thing you are doing in the experiment. It's the factor you're testing. In this case, it's temperature. The dependent variable is what is being measured as a result of the changes in your independent variable. In this case, it's the number of leaves. So let's look at 
our results. We're going to collect data. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to go to the lab, or we're going to go to the uh, greenhouses, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to go and count the number of leaves, and then we're going to record them by day. And we can see that we have 21 days or three weeks worth of data. So we're going to graph that. And notice that we don't have anything on our graph. We're going to try and make sure when we make a graph, big note on graphs here, is make sure that you're maximizing the use of your graphing space. Far too many students try to make uh, graphs that are so tiny that they really don't tell us anything. A graph is important because it gives us relationships and we need to be able to see that explicitly. So on the left here we have a graph and we're going to label our y-axis the number of leaves and our x-axis the days. And then of course we need a title, the number of leaves by day. Great, it's a simple title and it tells us exactly what we're looking at. An unacceptable title would be graph number one or my lab's graph. These things don't tell us anything about what I need to know in regards to the graph. So once we have our axes, then we're going to graph our data. And our first set of data is going to be temperature at 5 degrees Celsius. And so we've graphed it in blue. And then we're going to compare that then with our graph of the 22 degrees Celsius in red. And right away, I hope you're looking at this and saying, wow, they both lost leaves. But if you're looking at them closely, you're also seeing that one tree loses five leaves and the other loses only three leaves. So there's a difference of two leaves over the course of three weeks. Well, what would you conclude? Does this experiment demonstrate that trees in colder weather lose more leaves? Well, I mean, if you look at the data, it says yes, they do. But is it a significant difference? Is this a difference that might be related to perhaps other things? Or is this such a small change over the course of three weeks that we really couldn't attribute that to temperature? I'm certainly going for the latter. In three weeks, a tree could lose all of its leaves in the autumn. So a difference of two leaves seems really insignificant to me. And when you're considering your results, study your data. What does your data tell you? In this case, the hypothesis must be rejected. Temperature does not seem to have a significant effect on the leaves falling from a tree. Leaf loss must be related to some other factor, something we haven't studied yet. So notice here, though, that having the wrong hypothesis and rejecting your hypothesis does not mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean your experiment was worthless. If science is all about adding to the greater knowledge of our understanding, then what we've done here is we've recognized and shown that temperature is not related to leaf loss. We've done something. It's not a failure. But we also haven't really answered the original question. So let's go back. We know that leaves are still falling in the autumn, but we just don't know why. Why are leaves falling? Maybe they're falling because of the daylight hours are getting shorter. Okay, that makes sense. So, hypothesis. If trees are exposed to fewer daylight hours, then more leaves will fall. Why? Maybe the photosynthesis for the leaves is decreased and they can't survive anymore, so they fall off. Great idea. Let's test it. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to borrow from our last experiment. We're going to place two potted plants or groups of trees into two separate greenhouses. But instead of changing temperature, this time we're going to change the number of daylight hours from two hours to 12 hours. And then we're going to count the leaves again for three weeks. So we're looking at our data. And here we see that there's a big difference between the number of hours and the number of leaves. If you're looking at it, we can clearly see that the 12 hours keeps a lot of their leaves. Do they lose some leaves? Yeah, interestingly, even over the course of three weeks at 12 hours of light, which would be something we'd expect to have um, late summer, it still lost three leaves. But what about the two hours of sunlight? It lost all 50 leaves in the course of three weeks. So what would you conclude? Over the course of these three weeks, did we demonstrate that sunlight hours has a significant impact on the number of leaves? Absolutely. The hypothesis here should be supported. The number of light hours did have a significant impact on the number of leaves remaining from the tree. 
So notice though that we said that we supported our hypothesis, but we didn't really say we proved our hypothesis. Science is full of better explanations for the same information. So what we're really saying is that we think and we have supported the idea that sunlight is directly related to the number of leaves. It might turn out to be something different. Uh, there's something else might be a better explanation. We haven't proved anything, but we've definitely shown that there's a strong connection. Please also notice that the conclusions we've made here are based on collected data. It's not some expert's opinion. It's not what your teacher told you. It's what the data actually says. And as long as your data is objective, it's really hard to argue against that. So take what you know now and respond to the following experiment of 200 people re uh, reporting on headaches. Based on the following experiment design that you've, that's listed below, read through it and then identify what is the question being asked. Write the hypothesis. What is the independent and dependent variables and then make sure you can identify the experimental and control groups. Make sure that you respond in your notebook appropriately. I hope this has been helpful and thank you for watching another Wanik Science video.